The Disability Services Act 1996 probably was a, a, an unpredictable event, but at the same time it was inevitable, and I'll explain those two strange realities. I think um, uh, change in the disability area moves very slowly. Uh, it, it was a bizarre situation in the mid, early mid-1980s that the Commonwealth, that had been primarily funding disability services, did not know how many people with disabilities there were in the country. They really didn't have a sense of what their money was being used for. Uh, it was a case of first in, first serve. If, if you were a traditional agency that had been around for a long time, sometimes 100 years, you got the funding first and you might have got 100% funding, you might have got 80% funding. The newer kids on the block, well, the money wasn't there. They, um, if they, even if they wanted to run a traditional service, they couldn't get in. So I think that it, it was inevitable that we had some changes. The legislation at the time was the Handicapped Persons Assistance Act 1974, I think, um, and really uh, that enabled the Commonwealth to fund sheltered workshops and predominantly nursing homes and activity um, training centres. So, so really a very narrow way of providing services to people with disability. Okay, the Handicap Programs Review was quite significant because clearly the government, uh, and it was a Labor government at the time, uh, which had a substantial social justice agenda, uh, felt in some ways that they were um, up against the wall. I think there was there was some activism. There was lots of po there were pilot projects either funded by um, philanthropic organisations or indeed sometimes traditional agencies supported pilot projects that were radical, that were innovative, that uh, ideologically made sense, but also were cheaper. At least the argument was run that they were cheaper. Um, I think they were up against the wall, really, in many ways, to, to, to overhaul the existing legislation. The Handicap Programs Review was interesting because what happened was it was well funded. The Commonwealth uh, and each of its state um, offices was in charge of undertaking quite extensive consultations, not just at the level of bureaucracy, not just at the level of... Um, the traditional service provider, but actually talking to people with disabilities and their families. It was an extraordinary event, and I, I to this day cannot think of any other event where the notion of government consultation was taken seriously and it wasn't tokenistic. Um, I mean, there were problems in, in the sense that not everybody got heard, but uh, there were multiple meeting dates at different locations. Uh, you could arrange the Commonwealth's uh, uh, entourage of public servants and uh, camera people and recorders would often come to an institution if people couldn't get out to those places. Uh, people could make written submissions. It was also an era where you could make submissions in different formats, rather unique even still today, that people could send in taped, taped um, testimonials or stuff in Braille. I think, um, and people really felt that they were listened to and were engaged in the consultation process itself. And, uh, and of course, consultation is dangerous because it also raises expectations. So I think um, the Handicapped Persons Program Review resulted in a, in a report called New Directions. And there was a lovely summary document to, um, that was available that, uh, in plain English, outlined some of the possibilities for change. And they were radical. I mean, the first significant thing was that no funding would be provided by the Commonwealth unless you could um, have your service conform to a particular philosophy. I think the other really unique thing about it was that um, in terms of the process to, of change is different groups came together uh, to either support change or oppose it. And I think uh, that that's important. The groups that came together, people with disabilities, housing groups, accommodation groups, uh, employment services, a whole coalition of people, uh, parents groups came together, lawyers came together to support this process of change. I should say to you also was an era where there were a number of establishment agencies who were happy doing business in the old style, uh, providing um, sheltered workshops, providing employment conditions where people earned 50 cents a day. I think it's important to remember those circumstances where there were no award wages, uh, where there was no trade union protection. And of course there were institutions that still weren't providing uh, basic uh, necessities of life, proper food, proper diets, access to medical treatment, etc. A lot of those organisations were very threatened by the Disability Services Act as, when, when it came into being. Um, and, and by the Handicaps Programs Review, they still believe that um, 
it was immoral almost to to enable people with disabilities to to take risks one of the phrases at the time was dignity of risk to take opportunities a lot of those organizations felt that uh, people with disabilities had to be protected um, some of those people actually actively opposed the change process and you know as we hopefully will talk about a bit later actually undermined the operation of that legislation I think the other feature, uh, and uh, you know, I was involved in this myself as a public servant, and uh, I know you were, Alan, as well. Uh, we were recruited to um, either from within the public service or outside of it to be involved in this change process. Now that's unique. Most, uh, you know, when I teach um, uh, Australian policy these days, we say that the bureaucracy is, bureaucracy is there to administer policies of government, not to uh, shape and form them. In this situation, in fact, we were asked to almost be activists, to, to um, be true believers in, in uh, spreading news about this new philosophy, um, assisting organisations to, to model their funding proposals in, in, um, in accordance with that philosophy. And, you know, looking back at it, taking even that one step further, we were even asked to assist organisations to rewrite their submissions so that their, their proposals would be acceptable to, to government in order to get new things funded. So is, is that, that the style of approach where, for instance, Cassie would have been funded, would have been picked up by the Commonwealth Public Service? This um, is late nine, sort of 1988, somewhere around there. I, I think so. I mean, I'm not sure what happened in Queensland, but I think what we, you know, that we, we there was a number of services that, uh, and I'm using my language as against the official language, I think there were what we call the dud, never to be saved services that were so draconian. And again, they are, they were the very draconian services that were, the buildings were um, not able to be transformed, the staffing mentalities are very staffing structures. They might have just had doctors and nurses. Um, or um, people doing kind of um, very, uh, very um, suspicious therapeutic kind of work. Uh, then there were others that were kind of in between. Maybe the services need, needed to be broken up. Um, I can remember the mantra was you weren't allowed to fund what we called whole of life services. So you had to break up accommodation and employment services. You had to split them up um, into distinct entities. And some of those organisations, it was changing their structures and, and changing the internal operations too. Individual program plans, you know, even strategic planning was a rather novel aspect at the time. Um, there may have been other services like Cassie, for example, that uh, hadn't been funded. Maybe there had been attempts to get them funded and those services um, were funded with the new money. Um, sometimes organisations would force to, uh, and I say force rather, um, specifically were forced to cooperate with other organizations in the region to get together to talk to each other to consolidate their activities because in some areas they had no services in other areas they had too many left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing so i think in the early stages there were services in transition from the old style to the new style and uh, you know there were various kind of outcomes that had to be met as part of that transition process there were deadlines you might remember at the time and we all believed what was going to happen I can't remember the date I maybe I should have looked June, it up June 30 1992 June 30 1992 that was going to be the kind of the uh, the grim reaper of the disability world death knock that uh, were these services you know going to be defunded it would appear certainly in terms of the legislation and the regulations that we were operating with that they would be defunded but we also know that um, there were some extremely powerful forces at the time behind uh, behind um, those organisations and the ALP probably at that stage was in its latter years so there were obviously election issues as well at the time so I think uh, you know there were many organisations I think there's some lovely examples of organisations that did transit from the old to the new uh, I think in retrospect there were some that looked like they had ma made great leaps but in fact it only just changed their name and changed uh, the external ways of organising and I think the, the, the good side of it is that with the Disability Services Act, which eventually took, came into being in 1986, is that there were a number of really new innovative services um, that were able to be funded um, and, and funded well. Not as many as I would have liked, but funded well, yeah. But again, when you realise, well, what is it about these places? And what I say to my students, it's not just about the bricks and mortar. These places shape and form who we are. I showed a video last week with mental health survivors, 
people in their 50s, 40s and 30s. A lot of those people have been in institutions in and out. 